Hello and welcome to the second webinar for Java Mobile Development using Codename One. Uh, today I've got a, a great agenda set up for us. Uh, I'm going to spend just a, a couple minutes at the beginning with the introductory slide presentation. Uh, just the same as last week for those of you who are new to Codename One, just to give you a, a bird's eye view of uh, what it is and, uh, and how it works. Uh, then I've got a uh, demo app and tutorial set up that's going to take, uh, should should be 15 to 20 minutes and uh, we'll end up with a, a fun little game that my daughter's actually been playing the last couple days and can't get enough of it. Uh, and then a little later on we're going to be joined by Clement Levelois. Uh, you can correct me uh, on the pronunciation. And uh, he's got uh, some uh, some great information on code apps. Uh, a great new way to uh, learn more about mobile app development and, uh, and push your education forward. Okay, without further ado, let's uh, move on to the presentation. Uh, so, my name is Steve Hanna, and I work for Codename One, and we are working to reinvent mobile development. Codename One is a, a toolkit that allows Java developers to create native apps for all mobile devices. We're talking Android, iOS, Windows Phone. Uh, even JavaScript now, so it'll work on uh, you know, even more devices. Uh, J2ME and uh, BlackBerry also. It's free and it's open source. Okay, I got to apologize. I don't have any demos prepared for today. There's some screenshots of some of the apps that have been built. Um, you can check last week's webinar. I demoed uh, three or four apps. I just didn't uh, didn't have the space uh, this week for it. Uh, but I will show you a demo of the uh, the app we're going to build in a moment. So a look at the tool chain and how Codename One works, uh, because you might be confused. And how are we writing a Java app that runs on iPhone, for example? Because iPhone uh, won't run Java. Well, um, we've got the Java API. We've got a GUI designer uh, to lay out uh, the UI in a WYSIWYG fashion. Uh, we've got a simulator that uh, allows you to run it immediately to see how your app works and when you're ready to build it, uh, it sends it to our build server and there it gets converted into actual native code. On, an, on iOS that would be uh, down to Objective-C. So it's actually, the finished app is actually a native app. It's not, a, it's not running inside an HTML container. It's not running a, a, a real Java. It, there's nothing Java left in it. It's running native. And uh, then you just download the app from the cloud. And there's also cloud services uh, that, uh, that we do offer uh, for some uh, debugging, logging, push integration, uh, a lot of convenience things that you need in a mobile app. And uh, it's sort of glossed over. Uh, it works in all the major Java IDEs. There's plugins for IntelliJ, NetBeans, and Eclipse. Of course, they're free. So you can uh, download those. There's information on our website and how to get started with each of the IDEs. I'm going to use NetBeans today for our tutorial. Okay, just to gloss over some of the features, there's too many to mention in the slide deck here. Uh, the simulator is very fast, uh, unlike uh, Android uh, that takes a lot, a lot of time to fire up a simulator. This is usually just a second or two, after, uh, and you can just test out your app that way. Uh, because you're uh, working at that level in straight Java, you can do standard Java debugging right on your desktop with, uh, with your IDE. Uh, the GUI Builder, as I mentioned, it has some drag and drop development features. Um, it has great support for multiple uh, form factors and DPIs, because a lot of different devices now are, are coming with different DPIs. You've got Retina Display, uh, and you've got High uh, DPI. Uh, on uh, Android too. So there's some, some great features to allow you to embed uh, resources that'll look great on all different types of uh, devices. Um, automatic manifest permissions, that's a uh, uh, Android specific thing. Uh, so if you're building for Android, uh, you don't have to worry about a lot of the manifest and permission stuff that you normally have to do every time you add a feature. Uh, the build server uh, recognizes what you're using and takes care of that. Um, and uh, I should mention that it hides the differences between versions of Android. Uh, there's benefits, even if you're just targeting Android, to using Codename One in that you're developing to the Codename One API, which gives you uh, pretty much everything you need for a, a mobile app. And uh, you don't have to worry about 
the small variations between all the different versions of Android. Uh, the API, uh, right now we've got uh, Java 8 syntax uh, in beta, uh, so we've got lambdas and try with. We don't have a full, the, the Java SE, uh, for obvious reasons, like there's no reflection. Uh, it's to keep the, uh, the finished executables down to very slim size. You want a small application size, and uh, the API has been created very specially to, uh, to support that. Uh, it's got a... Uh, for the user interface, it's got a lightweight component hierarchy, very similar to Swing. Uh, the UI is pluggable, so you can uh, make it look like on Android, it'll be uh, look like Android. On iOS, it looks like iOS. You could even make it so that it looks the same across all the, uh, the architectures. So it's a very flexible user interface. Uh, in addition to the, uh, the core Java APIs like Java Lang and Java uh, uh, Util. Uh, there's a, a number of APIs that you would expect on a mobile device, like location, access to the GPS, camera, access to contacts, and uh, we provide additional APIs uh, for all of those things. And in addition to that, there is a, a third-party library format, CN1lib, that adds a lot of other functionality for uh, monetization, uh, for uh, uh, push. You can see there's just a list here of uh, a lot of different APIs. Uh, now, last time, we built a social network app, and you can uh, view last week's webinar. It's uh, available on YouTube uh, and on our Facebook page and our blog. Uh, so it was uh, a client-server application that uh, the client's written in codename one, and it does things kind of like Facebook. That was a really uh, cool app. We built it in under an hour, sort of. And uh, this time, we're going to uh, create a game. Uh, this is uh, sort of a twist on classic concentration. It's just a card matching game, and it gets the images from Flickr so that uh, you can get a different game every time with different images. So I'll just give you a demo of what the finished product is going to look like here. Ooh, I don't want to watch it in there. Quick time. Okay, so here I have uh, this game side-by-side, -side, Android and uh, iPad. So it starts off with a form. You do a search. It's going to go to Flickr, and it's going to find all the images that match that search. And it's going to set up uh, a card deck. It's, it'll have pairs, and you have to try to find matches. So on the left here, I've got a butterflies search, and on the right, I've got cats. The cats looks like a much harder game because the cats all look so similar. You can see I'm already uh, out front there with a match on the butterfly side. I appear to be terrible at this game. But this is, uh, you can see the, uh, the 3D flipping effect to flip the cards around. And the uh, resolution is actually better than what you see here in the in the video. But that's uh, what we're going to do and it's a very simple game to make with Codename 1. We're going to do that inside of about 15 minutes. As soon as I'm done this, we're going to uh, learn a little bit about code apps and uh, how you can learn more about mobile app development. Okay. Oh. oh. Okay, there we go. Okay, so back to our presentation. So what we're going to learn in this tutorial is uh, first we're going to create a new Java 8 project. We're going to learn about form creation and navigation. Uh, we're going to learn about using text fields and buttons. This is very basic stuff I know for the, uh, the experienced among us, but uh, I'd like this to turn into a, a nice users group where people can actually bring their own demos and uh, share things they've been doing. Uh, for starters, I'd like to make this accessible to newcomers uh, so that it's not intimidating. And we're going to uh, consume a Flick the Flickr REST API to get the images, and I'm going to show you how to do the, uh, the flip transitions. Okay, well let's get busy. I'm hoping you can all see uh, my NetBeans screen here. And I'm going to go File, New Project, Codename1. So if you've got the Codename1 
uh, plug in install the NetBeans, then you'll get this code name one option with the code name one project. Click next. Make sure you check the Java 8 project box because we're going to be using Java 8. And I'll call this uh, classic Flickr concentration 3. As you can see, I've got some previous uh, versions of this already in there. Now, uh, the next screen, it's going to ask for a package name. Now, this is very important because it's going to be used not only for where your uh, initial main class is uh, located, but also for uh, your App Store bundle IDs uh, for the Google Play Store and for iTunes. So I'm going to, uh, I want to make sure that I'm using the exact same settings that I did before. Now I'm going to make, uh, I've, I've laid out the step-by-step -step, uh, versions on GitHub here, and I can send the link out so you can all get it, but you don't need it right now. But if you want to refer to it later, uh, you can do that. So I'm going to use this for my package name. And for my main class name, classic Flickr concentration. Uh, now for the theme, last week I used the business theme. This week I'm going to use the uh, blue theme just because I think it looks a little nicer. There's lots of different themes you can use. It's worth mentioning that if you want the app to look different on Android than it does on iOS or the various versions, you would use the native theme, uh, in which case, well, this is the old iOS theme, but on the new iOS it would look like the, the current iOS. But for this app, I just want it to look the same on all platforms. So I'm going to use this nice flat blue theme. Um, and uh, for the template, uh, there's a few different templates. We're going to use the Hello World manual because we're going to be manually coding it. That's what the manual stands for. You could also use the GUI builder to build an app, but I'm not going to do that today. That'll be the, that would be the visual one. So use the Hello World manual, click on Finish, and this will create our app. So close this for now. So in the left project panel here, uh, we can see, I just want to go through the project structure. So under source packages, this created uh, we've a default package. This has a theme.res file in it. And this file is uh, where things like styles and embedded images for multi-DPIs are stored. Uh, if I were to open this, it would open in a resource editor. It gives me all kinds of uh, nice things, including being able to build GUI components. Um, we'll revisit that a little later. Uh, the next thing it gives us in the uh, package that I specified here, I've got my main class, Classic Flickr Concentration. And I'm going to go to that, and because I use the Hello World template, it starts out by just creating a form that says Hi World uh, and shows it. Now I want to talk a bit about this main class. It's, uh, I, it's called a lifecycle class. Uh, it's very similar to the, what you'd get in an applet or a servlet, uh, because there's a, an obvious life cycle to these apps. Uh, the, it's got an init method, which is called when the app first opens. It's got a start method that's called whenever the app comes into the foreground. A stop method that's called whenever the app goes into the background. And then a destroy method that's called just before the app is completely closed. So that gives you the main hooks uh, that you need in order to, uh, to build your app. So you can see inside the start method, uh, we just create a, a form and uh, we display it. So I can actually already run this in the simulator by just going to run project. And it's going to open up in the simulator and it just says hi world. Now the simulator has a few nice features. I can change the skin that I want to view it on. So I can, if I want to view the Android skin, it'll show me what it looks like with the Android phone. Because of the particular theme that I chose, uh, this looks the same on both Android and iOS, but one thing to notice in the simulator is I'm going to choose the iPhone 4 skin, and you're going to notice a slight difference here in the size. So you can see because my screen doesn't actually even have the full resolution of the number of dots uh, that an iPhone does, uh, or an iPhone 4, it doesn't even fit on my screen. Uh, this is because it has the exact same uh, form factor and resolution as the iPhone 4. So if you need to, your screenshots, which you would if you submit it to the App Store, you can just use the simulator, hit screenshot, it'll save it in the exact right dimensions and resolution you need for the App Store. And if you want to see it on this device, you can still zoom to 50% and have it fit there if you wanted to. But that's a, a nice feature of the simulator. So we'll quit that.
And now let's get started building the app. So you saw that uh, our game has two forms on it. It's got the entry form where you enter the, uh, the search term and it's got some instructions and then it's got the actual game grid form. So I'm going to, let's see, I think this was my starting point. I'm going to copy and paste the version I had here. Okay, so the changes that I've made to start with, I've created one method for each form that I want to show. This is often what I do. Later on, I may, may refactor it out so it's actually separate classes that, uh, that show these, or I might actually derive form. But at the beginning, I don't want to over-architect it. Just one method for new game form and one method for show board. Um, and then in the start method, I'm just going to show the new game form. And uh, that will get us to the, uh, the first point, just new game. We don't, I'm not going to show the uh, results in the simulator just yet because there's not as much uh, going on there. Let's flesh out that first form. Because we saw in the, uh, in the video, that first form looks like this. It's got a uh, welcome message with uh, some instructions a text field, and a uh, button to start the game. So inside my new game form, and I'm going to go through each of the, all of this. I'm going to set up the UI. So first I'm going to take care of my imports here. Okay, and the show board is expecting a search parameter. Okay, so what I've done here is uh, the first thing is I'm setting the layout on the, uh, the form to be a box layout along the y-axis. Uh, so Codename1 uses the concept of layouts similar to Swing, and a lot of uh, even Android has a concept of layouts uh, to lay out your components inside the, uh, the child components inside a parent. Uh, so the box layout is going to lay out all the components vertically down the page, which is what I want. Um, first thing is I'm going to add a span label. Span label is a nice uh, label that allows wrapping, so you can have multi-line uh, support. Uh, and I'll add a couple of them with just the instructions for my app. It's going to lay them vertically down the page because of my box layout. Uh, I'm going to add a search field. It's just a text field component. And use the uh, add component method to add that also to the form. And finally, I'm going to add a button with the label Start Game. And if you're familiar with Swing, uh, this Add Action Listener will look very familiar. Uh, we're adding a listener to be called when the search button is pressed. And you notice I'm using a lambda here so that this code is what happens when it's pressed. And I'm just going to call the Show Board method with the search term that was set in the uh, search field. Then add that search button and show the new game form. So if I just run this app now, we should have something that is a little bit functional. Uh, let's skin. I'm going to go back to 3GS so it actually fits on my MacBook Air screen. So search for anything. And then if I click on start game, because I've got that action listener there, it goes to my game board. And there's nothing on my game board yet, but we will work on that. Okay, well, the next thing let's do is uh, let's fill out the, uh, the game board. So I'm going to jump ahead. So here's, uh, take a little bit of code. That I'm, oh, not that one. Here's my show board at this point. So there's, this is a fairly simple form still. I'm not going to put in all the functionality yet. But I'm going to set the form to have a border layout. Border layout, if you're not familiar, uh, you have an item in the north, east, west, south, and center panel. And whatever's in the center gets filled out to take up most of the, uh, the page. So it's, it's pretty nice if you just want to nest things inside it. Uh, in the center, I'm going to use a grid layout inside a container. Container is a nice generic component. It's similar to a, like a J panel or something like that uh, in Swing. Uh, and uh, it just allows you to nest uh, elements below it. So if I create a, a container with a grid layout, it'll be perfect to allow me to lay out all my cards. The grid layout 
is exactly what it sounds like. You specify the number of rows and columns, and then all the child components will fit into the grid. They're laid out left to right, and then top to bottom, all with the same width and height. So it's a nice, nice looking grid. And I'm going to set up the number of rows I want in my game as just member variables here. And we'll do four and four, because that seems like it's a nice number. Okay. So, uh, I add the grid to the center of the form, and I'm also going to add a, a way to get back to my new form. So I just add a new button to the south panel. Well, this is a wrong indentation. And uh, similarly, uh, similar to the previous button, I add an action listener using a lambda, and it just shows the new game form. So I'm not going to show that yet because there's not really anything new to look at yet. Uh, we should be able to navigate back and forth at this point. So, the next step is let's actually start putting some cards on the board. Okay, so we're going to create a card component. So this is a custom component that just derives from... Oops. This, derives from container. I'm just going to use an internal class so that it can access all of the, the nice fields that I've already placed in my main class. Uh, so it's a simple container. Uh, it's got a constructor that takes a, a URL to the image that's going to be on the card. And I want there to be a method to be able to flip the card if I so choose. And for laying out the uh, form, oh, I haven't done that yet. So Inside this, this card component, I'm going to nest a button that actually shows the uh, front and back of the card. There's actually going to be two buttons, and I'm going to use a, uh, uh, a transition to flip back and forth between them. So let's take a look at what that's going to look like. Card component. Okay, so let's populate the constructor for this card component. Okay, so you can see we're going to set the layout of the card component itself to a border layout, uh, just so that uh, whatever I put in will fill it up. Um, and I'm going to have buttons for front and back. And uh, I'm using the, the button class. I'm going to pass it an image, which is the uh, will be treated as the icon for the button. So when you create a button, you could give it a, a string, which would be the label, or you could just give it an image. And we'll get that card back in a moment. I want to talk about this next thing I'm doing also, um, because the notion of UIID, if you're not a if you if you're not familiar with Codename One, might be new, and it's a fairly important concept. Um, Codename One allows you to specify a, a UI, a user interface ID, essentially, for any component. And that allows you to define in the GUI builder uh, what the, uh, the styles are on that component, like the background image, the border, the font, uh, padding, margin. Uh, if there was an equivalent, the closest equivalent I can think of is a, a CSS class in the, in the HTML CSS world. So if I just create a button and put it on the page, it's going to have all the styles of a button in my app. And buttons happen to have some nice, a nice beveled border with a background uh, image uh, that changes in color when you click on it. I don't want any of that. I just want it to show my image, and then we're going to flip it. So I'm going to change the UI ID of my button to label, uh, because the label is basically like a button. It just doesn't have the, uh, the clickability of a button. And uh, now I'm going to talk about the card back. So I need to have some sort of image uh, for my uh, the back of my card. So I'm going to open up the theme now. So in default packages over here on the left, I double click that and it's going to open the resource editor. And this is where I'm going to import uh, an image that I prepared for the back of the card. So it's got different sections here. Under images, I'm just going to go add images. And I've got my image already prepared here. It's a PNG. There, I've got it imported. So I'm going to save this resource file. And I can close it. 
And now I can access that image from code. So let's take a look at how I'm accessing that. So inside my init method, I want to load this image and resize it to be appropriate for the device that I'm using. So I've created a member variable where I'm going to I'll type encoded image hard back. And I'm I'm going to load this from the theme at the time that the app starts up. So it's a one-time thing. So what you can see here, if you look inside the init method, uh, the first thing it does is it loads the theme, which is it's loading the theme.res file into a local variable uh, or into a member variable theme. And it's uh, setting all the properties of the theme, like the styles. And this is how we get the app looking like it's looking. But one other cool thing that the theme object will allow us to do is we can get any of the images that are included in the theme and we can just load them into member variables. Uh, so here I'm loading the, uh, the card back image that I've put in there and I'm going to scale it so that the, the width is basically the size of a column and uh, or the width of the device divided by the number of columns in my grid and the height is uh, the height of the device divided by the number of rows. Now this isn't perfect because uh, there's also some extra space in the top and bottom so it's actually uh, the height is too high but uh, it's a crude estimate so I'll leave that to you as an assignment to figure out how to get the, uh, the sizing more accurate. Now I also could have used some of the, uh, uh, the multi-image support to actually pre-size it to be appropriate for different devices but uh, I decided to go this way just to get exact sizing for, for what I want. And now if we look at uh, my button, it's cleared up the compiler error inside the card. And uh, one last thing you'll notice inside the uh, constructor for the card is I'm adding the back button to the, uh, to the card component. So when we're adding a card to a, a container, it's adding the card and then anything that's nested inside it, which is the back button right now. So at this point, I believe, oh, I still need to populate my form. So for now, just to get my, my form filled up with cards, I'm going to put in this little loop. In the This is in the show board method. And I'm just going to loop through rows times columns and just create a new card. We're not going to worry about the URL yet. So I should be able to. I'm going to run it in the simulator again, just so you can see the progress. OK, and we'll just go test, start a game. And there we've got uh, all my cards. They don't do anything yet because I haven't uh, made them do anything yet. But that is loading the image back. Now this, uh, the image looks a little rough here in the uh, the simulator because I've got a lower resolution on my screen. But these look really slick um, on my uh, Nexus 5 and uh, in the iPad, it uh, comes out quite nicely. Okay, so the next step we need to do is uh, let's make those images so we can flip them. Right now we have a flip method uh, but it's not even being called and it's not implemented yet. So let's see if I've got a flip. Not yet. Load images. Oh. I think I'm looking for my next one. Okay, so let's flesh this out and add some action listeners to my front and back buttons. Okay, so we're going to update the card constructor. Uh, so all this was there before. Uh, we're going to create also the front card. For now, I'm just going to use the same back card images that I use for the front. And uh, the, oh, let me just check on something here. There we go. Yeah, just making sure I could hear if somebody did need to interrupt me. Okay, so uh, I'm going to use the same uh, same image for the front as for the back. We'll, we're going to, in the next step, load the images from Flickr. Um, but you can see I'm doing the exact same thing for the front as I did for the back. I'm going to add action listeners for each of the front and back button that just call flip. And then I just need to implement my flip method. It's going to flip the card over. So, this is a fairly simple implementation. 
So what it's going to do is uh, when you call flip, it's going to get the first component. We only have one child component in this. This get component at is a method of the container class that we're inheriting from. So we get the first one and we say, is this the front image? If it's the front, then we flip it to the back. Uh, to flip it to the back, all we do is use this, also a method of container, uh, replace and wait. It takes the source image that's already there, uh, we replace it with the, the back one, and we specify a transition. And in this case, I'm using the flip transition, and this should allow us to flip the card over. Now, the front and back are both the same right now, but we should be able to see the, the transition go through. So I'm going to test it out at this point just to make sure that the, the flip transition works. Okay, test. There we go. So we've got a card that will flip over and it's the same on both sides. Next, we're going to load stuff from Flickr. So we've actually got some different images to look at. And let's see if I've got that. Okay, yeah. So. I'm just going to copy and paste these full in because there's a, there's a fair bit there. And I'm going to talk about what they do. Let's. Okay, so I've pulled this get entries from Flickr service straight out of the Flickr demo uh, that we have on Codename One demos. And it uses the uh, Codename One connection request object. Uh, which is your gateway for any HTTP get or post or put requests um, and uh, using add argument to pass uh, get parameters. This is a nice, uh, the URL is a public uh, feed that Flickr provides for being able to search things and it'll find all the images that uh, match that criteria and it'll send back a JSON response. Uh, so this uh, network manager add to queue and wait, once we've got our connection request, uh, this is uh, a singleton object that manages all the network stuff and uh, it's there's two variations uh, we can use we can use add to queue or add to queue and wait add to queue is completely asynchronous it's just going to continue on uh, and then at some time later it's it's going to be uh, get the response uh, this is uh, using add to queue and wait so the next line this line won't even be executed until the request is complete uh, which is nice and handy uh, this uses uh, it also does it in such a way that it does not block the event dispatch thread. Now, if you don't know the, what the event dispatch thread is, then uh, don't worry yourself with it right now. Um, but it is a, one nice, cool feature uh, that, that we can do this without blocking the thread. And then the built-in JSON parser, so that we can parse the response into a, uh, a map, and then we get all the items. So this this stuff here is all because it's in a particular structure that we get back from Flickr. But in the end, we're just going to return a list of maps that have a nested structure that ultimately somewhere have the URL for these images. And I'm going to wrap this function in this function that's actually going to create all of my card components. I'm just going to import all of my uh, classes here. So essentially what's going to happen here is I it takes a keyword that I'm going to search for on Flickr and a number of images uh, that I need and it's going to get them all back from Flickr then it's going to loop through up to the number of images that I need get the URL for an image and then I'm going to create one new card object with that URL and another new card object with the same URL I need two because this is a matching game I want two cards to have the same image so I'm going to create two cards with the same URL and because I want it to be more interesting than just the two cards, two of the same images being side by side, I'm going to use collections uh, shuffle to randomize, to basically shuffle the deck. And then I'm just going to return that uh, list of cards, which the ultimate number of cards that this returns is twice what this input number is because it's got the uh, duplicates. Now I'm going to replace this code that created my cards with that uh, method that I just created. And uh, rows times calls over two. This is because uh, I want it to be half as many as the rows times columns. It'll double it again. Oops. And okay. So now that I've got my cards created, 
I still haven't actually done anything with the URL. I'm, I'm now starting to use the proper constructor, passing the URL. But if you look at my card constructor, it doesn't do anything with this yet. So let's correct that. Okay, let's see if I've got that in this version. Nope, that'll be in the next version. Okay, so let's take this version of the constructor and I'll show you what I've added. Okay, so I'm adding a member variable to keep track of the URL. And this is so that uh, we're going to use that actually to see if two cards match because the, the two cards will have the same URL. Um, I need to use the URL image class. Uh, this is a very convenient class that allows you to specify the URL somewhere on the internet of an image and uh, it'll download it and cache it to storage. So the second time it's loaded, it doesn't even need to hit the URL because it's going to get it from storage. Um, so this it uses URL image create to storage. I need to provide an image as a placeholder image so it knows what size to make it. And conveniently, I already have the back image, so I'm going to use that as the placeholder. The second parameter is the uh, key that is used in storage for the caching. And uh, so I'm just taking the URL and I'm adding the width in case I need to get it from different widths so it's not uh, going to get the wrong sized image. Um, give it the URL. And then this last one is an adapter to specify how I want the image to be resized. Because if it can't fit the, uh, the back image, we're getting all kinds of images on Flickr. Do we want it to just shrink it down and, and screw up the proportions? Or do we want it to crop it? Uh, this option here, the resize scale to fill, I find is uh, one of the most convenient because it will resize it to fill up the space available, but it won't, it won't uh, it'll keep the proportions accurate. So it may end up cropping it a bit, but at least the pictures will be in the proper proportion. Um, I've also, because we could end up with a race condition if we're loading the same image twice, I'm adding this little utility just a map to keep track of my URL images. I'll just spell that map. Oh, and I need to send a poem. So what this allows me to do is uh, if I've already loaded the URL, URL image for the same URL, I'm just going to load that same one that I've already done. And if I haven't loaded it, then I'm going to actually do the create to storage, uh, add it to that map to, to keep track of it or the, the second time around. And I also want it to preload the image. Now, URL image is set to not download until it's actually needed to display on the screen, which is usually great. But in this case, I want them ready to go when that flip occurs. So I'm going to preload them at this point with the uh, image fetch. Oh, there is a hand raised. Let's, I'm going to go back in here. Uh, sure. Uh, percent. Uh, do, do you want to just type, a, type your question in the, uh, uh, in the chat? Okay, I'm just going to stop to answer this question. Thanks for asking, by the way. I don't know if uh, people are lost at any point. You missed on the APIs. List the APIs. Uh, list the APIs as in. Uh, that's all right. How do you change project to work Java 8? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you, you have to go through. Uh, frankly, it's. Uh, I usually find it easier just to start a new project. I'm going to get to Prasant's uh, question in a second just because I know the answer to the, the Java 8 one. Um, just because if you want to change it to Java 8 after the fact, right now it requires going in and changing uh, the ant build script to, to change from 1.5 to 8 in all the places it occurs. 
and changing some of the uh, settings. So it's easier just to start a new project and then you check the Java 8 box on the first page when you, uh, when you create the new project. Okay, I'm actually going to uh, just, okay, yeah, that's right, easier to create a new project. I'm actually going to continue to, we're so close to done that I'm going to continue this last step and then I'm going to open it up for, uh, for questions for everybody and I, I want to have time to get to, uh, Clement has joined us to talk about, talk about the MOOCs, so um, that's going to come up in a, a few moments also. Uh, so um, hang on to that question, Prashant. I'm not sure I, I understand it at this point, but I'm going to give you uh, some more time uh, to help me understand in a moment. Okay, so let's take this, or did I already do, okay, I've already done that. Okay, so I am loading, uh, I'm preloading the URL image, and then on my front button, instead of loading the card back again, I'm just adding the, uh, giving it the URL image that I've loaded. Uh, the rest of this, I believe at this point, is the same, but I also need to do something. I want to make sure when I'm showing the board that I'm clearing out that cache because I don't want to. I don't want these URL images just loading up, uh, taking up memory after I'm onto new games. So where is my show board uh, loaded? Where else? Clear. Okay. So that should. At this point, we should have a uh, functional. Game, I believe. I'm gonna get this. So let's try this out. So search for cats, nice and easy. Okay, let's flip it over. Oh, we have a cat. We have another cat. And we can flip and we'll go back to the, the back of the card. So we now have a functional thing. We can actually flip some cards over. The last step is really just throwing in the logic for the game. Uh, so I'm going to skip to uh, the last one here, which is basically our completed app, and then I'm just going to go over some of the logic that's in there. Actually, I've made some changes. I'm going to I'm going to use the version I have here. Make sure I've got it in the right one. Okay, so let's go through and see what I've done. I've just made some small changes to enforce our uh, our game rules. So um, one thing I've done is I fleshed out the uh, flip method here because I don't want people flipping things at the same time. Uh, well, the game logic is basically uh, you flip one card over. Uh, and then you flip another card over, and if they match, they stay flipped over. If they don't match, they flip back over. Um, and uh, that's basically the way it works. So I need to keep track of that first card when it's flipped over so that I can compare it to the second card. So uh, one thing that makes my life easier is if I'm flipping one card, I don't have to worry about a person's flipping a whole bunch of cards. So I'm setting a member variable on the whole app is checking if it's flipping right now because I don't want you to flip two cards at the same time. And I'm saying when you're flipping a card, if it's flipping, or if the card is already matched, then I just want to return so the flip doesn't do anything. Uh, then I set this flipping flag. Um, I'm also checking to see if it's flipping to the front because I, I'm going to do some special stuff when you flip the card over to the front. I set that to true when it's a front flip. Uh, at this point, uh, after I've done the replace and wait, I'm going to say, okay, the they're not flipping anymore, so I'm going to undo this flag. And uh, then I check if we're flipping to the front, then I'm checking, first of all, is the current card, because I've set a, uh, a member variable, you can see. Okay, where's, where's the member variable? There we go. Per card, current card. So I've set a member variable to keep track of the current card. And that represents if there's one card already flipped over. So if there's no card flipped over yet, then we're going to say, well, this card is now flipped over. Um, otherwise, if a card is flipped over and this card that I just did is a match for it, then I'm going to set each other as their own match, and I'm going to set the current card to null to, to reset it. Uh, 
so that so they'll just stay flipped over. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to flip both cards that are up back over because they don't match. We're just going to flip them back over, and I once again going to set the current card to null. Uh, my methods to be able to check for a match uh, is match four checks to see if uh, the URL of one card matches the URL of the other, and then I added a convenience method so for any card you can get the matching card for it if it's been matched. Um, other than that, I think that is our fully functioning game. Uh, let me check. I might have added some other cleanup stuff. No, I did not. So there, there's still a few uh, rough edges on this that you can, uh, you can go over in your own time, but uh, I'm going to run this now in the simulator. And uh, let's search for dogs this time. So flip that one over and that one over. They don't match, so they flip back over. That one over, that one over. They don't match. Will I find a match? Did I see that one already? I don't know. Well, I happen to be terrible at this game. Is that that one? No. Okay, well, anyways, you get the idea. Hopefully, oh, I've got to find a match. I can't remember. No. Nope. What is that? I saw that one before. Uh, okay, as you can see, completely hopeless at this game. Okay, there we go. We have a match. Thank you, everybody. Hold the applause. Uh, and then uh, so on. That is our game. It's a functional game, and quite honestly, my daughter's been playing it uh, all last night. Uh, she loves it especially uh, playing with dogs and cats. So once we've got it working, this is obviously a million dollar app, then what you can do is uh, build it for Android or iOS and, and ship it off to the App Store. So I just want to go over how that looks. Uh, if we right click here under the code name one menu, uh, we've got all the different options for building for iOS, Android, Blackberry, J2ME, Windows Phone, Mac OS, uh, the full gamut. Uh, of course, you have to set this up a little bit. If you go into properties, uh, if you're building for iOS, you have to specify the certificates. Uh, you have to have a valid Apple account. Uh, and uh, if you do, then we can help you generate the certificates using a certificate wizard. You just hit generate and it'll walk you through the steps. Uh, Android is a little bit easier because you can uh, generate your own uh, key store. So I've already got one here. So I select my key store. Put in a password, my alias, and then I can build for Android. So I can send this off. It's going to send it to the build server. Code name one. I'm just let's just watch the progress on here. Uh, apparently my uh, libraries are a little bit out of date here, so it's just updating them, and then it's sending the build request to the server. Build successful. So it gives me this URL to go to on the server. I could just go to the codename one site and it's the dashboard. And uh, here it is. And it shows me these are all the ones that I've built before. When it's done, it gives me this little QR code that I can uh, download with my uh, with any phone that's got the QR code reader. Uh, or I can download it directly. What I usually do is click on the email link and uh, That'll just email the link to my phone, and then I can just install it that way. So that's uh, nice and easy. Usually it takes, like you can see, the previous attempts took 43 seconds each. This is, should be done any second now, but uh, it'll look exactly the same as that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our working demo. And, oh, yeah, you can see it's, our, it's already done there. It took, oh, two seconds longer than, than the other one. So it's pretty fast. Okay. So, um, now I want to get back to the questions. There, there was a question about the, the APIs. All the APIs uh, that we're using are, uh, the best way to, to actually see what's available is to go to the website, and uh, it's got uh, all the docs available. And so there's Java docs of the APIs, and this is the whole thing. It's, it's the equivalent of the... Like we've got abstract lists here, which is a Java util abstract list. If it ain't here, then it's not, not going to work in code name one. But most of the stuff 
is like a lot of the stuff is just regular uh, Java, you know, CLDC 11 uh, with augmented to support uh, a lot of the Java 5 collections and, and uh, that stuff. There's some added, you can see it with all these packages, we've got a charts package, capture, analytics. There's a lot of stuff here, Facebook, social. Um, really, it's, it's most of what you'd need to build an app. And if it's not there, then you, there's native interfaces too. So you can interface directly with the, uh, uh, with the OS, uh, with native stuff. So, oh, here's, here's a question for, for it gaming. Oh. <laughs> OK, so um, are there any other questions? I'm going to hand it over to uh, Clement in a moment uh, to talk about uh, the, uh, the code apps, which is a, a really cool thing that I'd like to learn more about. Um, if you have now. OK, so thanks a lot to uh, Steve uh, for inviting me uh, uh, in this uh, webinar, I was uh, personally impressed by the uh, d by the, the demo and uh, well uh, in uh, less than an hour. Uh, so um, uh, what I would like to discuss with you is um, uh, Code Apps. So let me give you the link to it. And Code Apps is a MOOC, which means that it's a free online um, course over uh, eight weeks. Uh, and the, this, uh, it's uh, hosted on uh, Coursera and it's starting um, at the end of September. So these are um, uh, online courses, uh, mostly made of uh, videos, uh, short videos of uh, 10 minutes, uh, a couple of them are a bit longer, uh, and some uh, written uh, uh, PDFs to, to help. Uh, and so the, the audience or the target for this course uh, is a bit different from uh, what we have seen uh, today. Uh, basically, it's a course um, using, of course, uh, Codename One, so uh, uh, very close to the content uh, that we've seen today. But the difference is that it's for uh, complete beginners. It's for people who have never coded before. Uh, so. It makes a difference in the steps we take, in the sense that the first app we're going to build in this course is uh, fully built uh, with the uh, with the designer, uh, no coding. Uh, the app uh, which you can build this way is a CV, right? So you put your face uh, on it and you uh, you write some text on what you have uh, uh, done uh, in your career and you put that. Uh, in uh, on the play stores and the app stores so we spend a lot of time um, discussing how to build certificate even if uh, uh, with the wizards it's really it has become really uh, easier and in the second step of the course we actually start coding but uh, in a way that uh, i try to explain things to non-coders and as you imagine it's uh, it's a bit difficult because you have to explain uh, the concept of uh, oriented object or object oriented uh, coding so i do my best and we'll see whether it, it's a success or not but i must say that uh, the incentive to build apps uh, i hope will uh, will drive the participants to uh, to concentrate and uh, um, and 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 get to the step where they build app apps so the app we build in this second stage is a, a, a Twitter, a bit like Twitter, or so a bit like the chat app that we've seen uh, with uh, Chen or or the social media app. Uh, I think uh, Steve has built. So basically, just to demonstrate how you can send stuff to uh, the internet and get stuff back from the from the internet. Uh, to conclude, uh, I want to give you two things. First, it's the uh, an initiative uh, that we start next week. So on Monday, we are going to travel with a couple of students to uh, to uh, uh, several uh, cities in Europe uh, to organize meetups and and uh, basically uh, try to excite participants in uh, joining in the in the MOOC. Um, and in each meetup, we'll have just like we did today uh, uh, a one-hour. Uh, 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 hands-on coding session so people bring their computer and their, and their phone and we build a, a CV in one hour. Uh, and the last thing I want to share is that just today we got 
the pre-registration link to the to the well to the MOOC on Coursera. So it's not public yet. We want to make a big uh, or I mean we want to make an announcement on Monday because the bus is leaving and we want to uh, take this moment to share uh, to share the pre-registration uh, link. But you can already, uh, I mean, uh, just for you in this webinar, you can already click and I see it being shared. Uh, the prayer registrations are basically opened. So that's it. And just to conclude, I, I just want to say I'm really, uh, uh, I feel just privileged to be, uh, uh, to be able to use this uh, amazing framework and to uh, ask for uh, help uh, to Steve, to Chen and the other uh, people who contribute. So thanks to them. Thanks, Clement. It's, uh, oh, it's really interesting. Well, Hen is uh, typing something uh, here, but uh, that's so that's the uh, the full agenda that uh, that I had here. Uh, I'll stick around if, if you want to just uh, ask some questions. This is a good forum. We brought we've got uh, you know presumably a, a bunch of people who are uh, either interested in mobile development or, or who are coding. Uh, code name one right now if you want to use the, the chat here and, and the, the opportunity to just uh, chit chat for the, we're going to be doing another one in a couple weeks so if you got any apps you want to demo just uh, let me know and uh, we'll pull them out also if you got any topics you want to cover there's there's so much to cover I, I just sort of reaching at things to that uh, people might be interested in well thank you everybody for coming Anticipation when you see so many people typing, multiple attendees. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'm going to turn off my mic now, but I'm going to I'll leave the chat on uh, for a little bit. <laughs>